We've been studying 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for the last several weeks, and we continue that today. Last week, Reverend Donna Lucas was here, and I asked her, I told her what we were studying, and she said she would be willing to, to pr- pick up on that theme as well. So she did while I was away celebrating my son's uh, marriage, and it was a, a wonderful time for us together as a family to celebrate Gavin and Ella's love and beginning their married life together. Um, first, chap- first Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the love chapter. It's the, it's the number one scripture that's read at weddings, which is kind of interesting. It certainly does give valuable advice to a newlywed couple or to a husband and a wife about how they ought to love each other. But this chapter was not originally written for weddings, although we so often associate it with that occasion. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 was not specifically written about romantic love at all. It was actually written to correct a dysfunctional church that was not showing Christ's love to each other And because of that, they couldn't show it outside of their walls either. So the Corinthian church, to whom Paul wrote, had a lot of serious problems. There were power struggles in the church. There was jealousy among its members. Some were claiming spiritual superiority because they could heal or speak in tongues or prophesy. And so they thought they should get special treatment because they were superior spiritually to others in the church. Others were abusing the sacrament of Holy Communion, actually uh, gorging themselves on the communion wine and getting drunk, while others in the church, not leaving, they weren't leaving anything for anyone else so that they couldn't even celebrate communion. So some were getting drunk and some didn't have anything at all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, We read that one Corinthian man was actually sleeping with his father's wife. In other words, his stepmother. And it doesn't tell us whether his father was still alive or not. But in either case, um, Paul has to get on to this man and to the church because they have ignored his sexual immorality. He says, it's not right that you would sleep with your father's wife. Pagans, he says, don't even do that. And you're supposed to be Christians. And so Paul writes... You are so proud of yourself, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship, he writes. Paul wrote the first letter to the Corinthians to reprimand the church and to try to bring them back to authentic Christianity. The letter comes to a climax in the 13th chapter that we've been studying. As Paul explains, that the most important thing, what it all comes down to, is love. But the kind of love we're talking about is not some wishy-washy, warm and fuzzy, feel-good kind of love. It's a deep, sacrificial love. It's the way God loves us. It's a love that is demonstrated best by Christ dying for sinners on the cross. Not because they deserve it but because they desperately need it. And so we read on in Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Love does not rejoice about injustice. Now in the New Living Translation that I just read, it says love does not rejoice about injustice. In the New International Version, it says love does not delight in evil. So it says the same thing in these translations, but just in different ways. The world today, I believe, has a warped idea about love. Surely, people today value tolerance. So naturally, they like the idea of love being patient and kind. 
You know, there are so many. We live in a country where uh, we have such diversity, which is a, which is a great thing. But it, re, it means that we, we have different beliefs, and they vary quite a bit. And we behave differently from place to place and from generation to generation. So surely in our community it's important that we value tolerance. Because in order for all of these different kinds of people to get along, we have to be very tolerant of one another. And that's true. And that's a good thing. And that means that people can hear a scripture like 1 Corinthians 13, which says you need to be patient and kind. And they think, yes, I like that. I can get on board with that. But most people would prefer to chop off that part that says love does not delight in evil. Or love does not rejoice about injustice. Because that means you've got to take a stand. That means you might have to tell someone what they're doing is wrong. And biblical love holds people accountable to God's holy truth. A big part of the problem is how people define what is evil. Have you ever thought about that? What does it mean? What is evil? At first thought, somebody asked me that, or one of my professors asked me that in seminary. And the first thought was, well, everybody knows what evil is, but do they? Do we all have a clear agreement on what evil is? And what we find is that the world has one standard, and that standard changes from generation to generation. Things that were considered evil when I was a child are accepted now, even praised as good and wholesome today. And some things Today, that uh, are considered to be evil were, were accepted and just normal when I was a child. Because society's standards change from generation to generation, from decade to decade. But God's standards of good and evil never change. They are the same today, yesterday, and forever. And they are preserved in God's holy word. And Christian love holds people accountable to God's standards of good and evil. That is why the Apostle Paul can write to the Corinthian church about love, and in the same letter he can also say, it isn't right for a man to sleep with his stepmother. You need to remove this man from your church if he won't repent of his sin. Now some people today will say, well, removing someone from a church, that's not a very loving thing to do. That's because the standard by which we live today in the 21st century says that, that, that love isn't supposed to be like that. Love is supposed to always be nice and happy and good to people. But that's the society standard. Is that what God's standard is? Because what I read in Scripture is that real love doesn't put up with evil and injustice. It holds people accountable. We see a lot of evil and injustice in our world today. And Christians who are loved by God in Christ and who also profess to love God and to love our neighbors, we ought to call out evil and injustice whenever we see it. Even if it it, uh, it makes people kind of look at us a little cockeyed and say, well, why are you rocking the boat? Why are you rocking the boat? Can't you just get along and let people get along? Well, no. God is not happy with injustice. God is not happy with evil. And he wants his people to take a stand for what is right and what is good in his eyes. And of course, we need to start with ourselves. Always start with ourselves as as an individual. And maybe even start with ourselves as the church. Evaluating ourselves before we start pointing fingers at other people. Jesus once said, Why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? So where do we see evil and injustice in our own lives? Or maybe in our own congregation? You know, you got to be careful. 
that you don't let pointing the finger at someone else be an excuse to ignore your own problems and mistakes. Examine yourself. Ask the Lord to reveal where you have fallen short. Repent of your sin and ask the Holy Spirit to reform you. As David wrote in Psalm 51, ask the Lord to create in you a clean heart and renew a right spirit within you. Of course, don't let your own imperfection be an excuse to rejoice about evil and injustice in the world either. I know that there are many people who um, are self-righteous and always pointing out everybody else's sin that they never look at their own. But the opposite of that is sometimes true as well. There are some people who feel like they never have a right to say someone else's behavior is unacceptable because they look at themselves and they realize in humility they've got a lot of things wrong inside their heart as well. And so they would say, well, I can't tell anybody else how to live their life. I can't even figure out how to live my own life. But I don't think that God would want that. Don't let your own imperfections to be your excuse to rejoice about evil and injustice in the world. Because when you keep silent, sometimes your silence condones what is evil. It's almost as if you're rejoicing over it. But love does not rejoice with injustice. Love does not delight in evil. Love rejoices when the truth wins out. Love doesn't just go around telling people how wrong they are all the time. Love rejoices when the truth wins out. Love is happy when people finally get it. Love is overjoyed when it sees someone earnestly repent and turn to God. Love celebrates with a feast when the prodigal son comes home and reconciles with his estranged father. Love looks for the good and celebrates it every chance it gets. Jesus is the best example of true love. I guess that's because God is love and Jesus is God, and so Jesus is love. And we see in him love's purest form. Jesus never condoned evil. Yet in love, Jesus knew how and when to call out evil and to call people to repentance and also to rejoice when the truth won. So today, I want to close with a story from Jesus' life that I think illustrates how love does not delight in evil, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. And this story comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 48. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. We looked at this passage um, a little while ago in my Sunday school class and heard something interesting about it. This perfume, this jar of perfume that this woman came with, and the scripture tells us she was an immoral woman, probably um, it is thought that this perfume was part of her trade. If she was a, a prostitute, um, she would want to smell attractive for her clients. So it is thought that this alabaster jar of perfume <clears throat> that she brought to anoint Jesus' feet with was part of that. Now, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark tell this story as well. And they say that when the woman came and anointed Jesus, that she smashed the jar. She broke it so it could never be used again. And that's heavy with symbolic meaning. 
showing that she is at Jesus' feet and she is giving her sin to him. She is letting it go and she's never going back to the way she lived before because she has smashed the jar. And then it goes on in verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces of silver to another. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Today we have the privilege of sharing the sacrament of Holy Communion and rejoicing that the truth has won. Jesus gave his life so that we can repent of our sins and return to God to let him be the Lord of our life. When we accept that God is the rightful Lord of our life and we surrender to his will, we are saved by the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. Truth wins and we should rejoice. When we accept Christ and follow him as Lord, the angels in heaven rejoice. They have a big party to rejoice that the truth has won in our life. So we should rejoice as well. And so as we come to this precious moment this morning, I want you to examine your own heart. Ask in prayer, Lord, show me the sin for which I need to repent today so that I may come to your table and celebrate how your truth has won a victory in my life today. And so I would give you a moment now for silent reflection and prayer. Ask. Gracious God in heaven, hear our prayers. On the night Christ was to be arrested, he shared one last meal with his disciples. And at that meal he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, Take and eat, this is my body that is given for you. And likewise, after the meal he took the cup and he raised it to heaven. He asked the Lord to bless it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your grace and for your love that calls sin, sin. But grace that also welcomes and accepts us despite our sin. And a love that is so powerful can transform us so that we become the people you originally intended us to be. Help us to not rejoice with evil, but to rejoice when the truth wins. Help the truth to win in our lives in some small way or in some eternal grand way right now. And so we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread and this wine and on us gathered here, that the bread might be for us the body of Christ and that the wine might be his blood, that we might be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. If I could have my, if I could have the musicians and the assistant come first to receive communion. Tom, this is the body and blood of Christ. Stephen, the body and blood of our Lord. Mark, the body and blood of Christ. Philip, this is Christ's body and blood. Sarah, the body and blood of our Lord. Kathy, the body and blood of Christ. So, this is not our table. This is not our bread and wine. It is the Lord's table and the Lord's meal. And he, just like he welcomed uh, the, lady, the woman to come, and when the Pharisee said she didn't belong, Jesus said, yes, she does. Because she has repented, and she's coming to anoint me. And so it doesn't matter whether you're young, or whether you're old, or whether you're a member of this church or not. All that matters is that you sincerely wish to repent, and to come receive the gift that Christ has for you today. And if that is the case for you, you are welcome to come 